Thank you, Ross. At this time, the children are going to go to the, the Sunday school. The, most of the children are upstairs, and Gabby's going to take them all out for the Easter egg hunt, I believe. Thank you. At this time, we're going to come around the Word of God. We'll be looking at John's Gospel in the 20th chapter. He probably writes this this gospel around 85, 90 AD. At this particular point in time, all the other disciples have been killed or martyred. And the message today is the resurrection garden. You've probably picked up that up from when I read in Genesis, the Garden of Eden. We saw the DVD clip, it's about the garden. But I want to talk about the resurrection garden. There's nothing more beautiful than a garden. Yesterday, the sunshine was shining in urn, which is quite rare. And we were enjoying the gar our own gardens. So here we have John's gospel. He's the most reliable witness. He was the closest to Jesus uh, um, compared to the other authors um, of the gospels. Mark, um, Luke, well, Luke, he was a historian and physician. So he wasn't a disciple. Uh, and Mark, he wasn't a disciple either. So we've got the most accurate account when we look at John's gospel. Not saying the others are not accurate because they are. But John was, he was there. He, he got up close. He saw what had happened. He is the perfect one to tell us what has happened. And today we celebrate the greatest day in the history of the world regarding the resurrection. Jesus was crucified on a cruel Roman cross. He died and he arose from the grave three days later. After all, it was back then that Jesus overcame death, hell, and the grave. And this one truth sets Christianity apart from every other religious belief system in the world. And if there were, if we were to strip Christianity of the doctrine of the bodily resurrection of our Lord, then our faith would be no more. It would just be another religious system that condemns souls to death. If Jesus did not rise from the dead and is not alive today, then everything he did was in vain. After all, if he did not rise, then our faith is in vain and we would have no hope beyond the grave. And yet today, it's an exciting day for Christians as we celebrate the resurrection of our Lord and Savior. The followers of Jesus had gone through a very emotional time. But you would think surely it can't get any worse. Look what happened to Jesus. He was betrayed. He was beaten. He was rejected. He was crucified and he was whipped. And his followers deserted him. Only John stayed at the cross. Even Peter denied him three times. After all that was left, there was hopelessness. There was the shame of remembering what had happened. And yet... On the Friday, Joseph of Arithamea, a rich man, and Nicodemus helped to bury Jesus. You read that in John's Gospel, the 19th chapter. And Jesus was buried in Joseph's tomb. Now, if mankind had fallen in a garden, it is fitting that Jesus Christ should rise again in a garden. And yet God loves beauty. He loves order. And he saw that to it that his son would rise again in a beautiful garden. Of course, kings had their gardens. Solomon had his beautiful gardens with great orchards and fruit trees. The point is that kings have gardens. So isn't it right that Jesus had his very own garden on Resurrection Sunday? Think of Nebuchadnezzar. You just, I mean, you could go through the scripture and read about kings that had gardens. But Nebuchadnezzar had the hanging gardens of Babylon. You think of what it says in, in 2 Kings 21, 6. It talks about the garden of Uzzah. Then Josiah, his son, reigned in this place. So, so you've got Ammon, King Ammon being buried there. And so here we are this morning. And I want to look at three mistakes in the resurrection story. Not that God's word has any mistakes, but it's the people we're going to focus on. We're going to be looking at the grave. We'll, go, we'll look at the mistake with the gardener and the mistake in the garden. So let's look at the first mistake. The first mistake is at the grave. 
as it sees, does it? So I'll let the technicians work this out and I will continue to minister. So if you don't have nice texts up here, please bear with us. So the first mistake is at the grave. Let me read verses 1 to 4 in John 20. Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. Then she ran and came to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved and said to them, They have taken away the Lord out of the tomb and we do not know where they have laid him. Peter therefore went out and the other disciple and were going to the tomb. So they both ran together and the other disciple outran Peter and came to the tomb first. So what we have is the stone. Our text reveals that three individuals came to the grave that day. It focuses on three individuals. We know that that Luke's gospel tells us there were other women. There was Mary Magdalene, there was Joanna, there was Mary, the mother of Jesus. And and Luke also says um, there were other women. Um, Mark also adds Salome um, to the number. But we're focusing on Mary Magdalene. She was at the grave before daylight. And this is what John focuses on is Mary Magdalene. And we, t- we talked about Mary Magdalene during Mother's Day. And, and so G- Mary's thinking Jesus was taken away. After all, Jesus talked about his resurrection. A week earlier, Jerusalem was buzzing with the story of the resurrection of Lazarus. So Mary Magdalene knew this. But what does she see? She believed that because the stone had been removed, that Jesus' body was taken away. Of course, Matthew 28 gives us more details that there was an earthquake, there was an angel there. And so Mary forgets the words of Jesus. She mistakes the words of Jesus and thinks his body has been stolen. And John and Peter, they hear about this. Mary tells them, and of course, Peter and John run to the grave. John, the younger one, gets there first. Peter knows he's messed things up with Jesus. He's denied him three times. And so he wants to get there to make things right. And John just loves Jesus and he outruns Peter. So the stone's removed. But then we look at verses 5 to 9. And what do these verses say? And he stooping down and looking in saw the linen cloths lying there. Yet he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came following him. And went into the tomb, and he saw the linen cloths lying there. And, you always have to turn the page when there's an and, don't you? The handkerchief that had been around his head, not lined with the linen cloths, but folded together in a place by itself. Then the other disciple, who came to the tomb first, went in also, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not know the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. In those days, graves were cut out of rocks. And obviously, Joseph of Arithamea, he was was wealthy, and he has this beautiful tomb cut out where Jesus is put in. And when the body lay in the tomb, a large stone, we know, was placed over the entrance, and it was very heavy. In fact, it was true that the stone was removed But they want to have a closer examination of what is inside the grave. They see linen strips. If you're going to steal a body, you don't leave the linen strips behind. But there is something else that Jesus left behind. It was a napkin, a handkerchief. It was folded. And in that culture, when it was folded, what that was saying was a statement, I've left for a moment, but I'm going to return. And of course it says, He saw and believed. John gets it. Mary still doesn't. And so Mary's sobbing. We read verses 10 to 13. I'll quickly read those. Normally in an Easter Sunday, you've got to preach the message from the four Gospels. And I just don't want every message to sound the same. But I want to pick out something particular. But let's look at verses 10 to 13. Then the disciples went away again to their own homes. But Mary stood outside by the tomb, weeping. And as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white sitting, one at the head and the other at the feet, where the body of Jesus lay. 
Then they said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. Mary still doesn't get it. Peter and John went back to their own homes. I don't know why, maybe to pray, maybe to reflect. But Mary still remains. She's sobbing her eyes out. And if you lose a loved one, that's what you do. It's natural. But Mary had her eyes focused on physical evidence rather than spiritual facts. After all, Mary had made the mistake that someone had removed Jesus from his grave. And yet there was two angels at the tomb because two is the number of witnesses that you needed. Therefore, they asked Mary why she was weeping because she still didn't get it. She still didn't understand. Verses 14, what does it say in verse 14? Let me read verse 14 for you. Now, when she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there and did not know that it was Jesus. She still hasn't got it. And sometimes people are like that. They still do not recognize Jesus even when he is standing in their midst. Mary soon realized that there was someone standing near her in the garden. She sees a man standing near her, but she doesn't recognize that it was Jesus. Therefore, Jesus asks Mary two questions that are designed to expose her to the truth, which we see in verses 15. But Mary, like so many of us, seemed determined to live by sight rather than walking by faith. So the first mistake is at the grave, and we see Mary makes that mistake of not understanding and recognizing her Lord and Savior. But I want to focus really on verses 15. This is a key verse this morning. Let me, and the second mistake is with the gardener. This is the second mistake is with the gardener. So let me just read verses 15 for you. And this is what it says. Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? She, supposing him to be the gardener, said to him, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him and I will take him away. So the second mistake is with the gardener. The first mistake is with the grave. When you look at this, I am inquisitive about a very minor detail that seemed almost insignificant here. In fact, I am fascinated about why Mary thought Jesus was the gardener and why it is mentioned. Why did Mary think Jesus was the gardener? Why is it mentioned? After all, What does John say in chapter 21, 25? John's gospel says, and there are also many other things that Jesus did, which if they were written one by one, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. So much happened in Jesus' short life here on earth that John is saying that the world couldn't contain all those books. But then you would think, why then? Does John make this statement? Why then does John write about this one precious thing in this gospel about the gardener? And you think, why does he do that? Supposing him to be the gardener, why does he do that? Yet it was only a mistake that flashed through Mary Magdalene's mind about Jesus. So this mistake, we need to have some kind of investigation. The mistake is recorded because Mary failed to identify her Lord at first sight. But curiosity demands an investigation because it is there for a reason for us to learn. Therefore, Mary's mistake informs us that there was a garden and it was very well kept. You don't have a gardener that doesn't keep a garden well. It's obvious. Jesus was buried in a beautiful large garden with flowers and shrubs. We're informed in John 19, 41 that he was cruised. There was... Nearby, um, the place where he was crucified, there was a garden and and a new tomb, which no one had yet laid in. In fact, it informs us that it was a nice garden with this new tomb, with a higher gardener. So what we have is this illustration. Mary could never have assumed that Jesus was the gardener unless she was actually in a garden. Yet in this early hour, we have the illustration of a garden. What do you have in gardens? You have roses, you have lilies, you have beautiful flowers. And you can actually do a study on the flowers. 
I mean, what do roses represent? They represent kings. They represent perfection. They represent beauty. They represent peace. All characteristics of who Jesus is and was. The lilies represent Israel as a flower among the nations. And you give it to a loved one. And so we know that the scripture calls Jesus the rose of Sharon and the lily of the valley. What does it say in Songs of Solomon? Second chapter, I am the rose of Sharon and the lily of the valley. I mean, you could do a real study into this. But what we get is information. God started human history. Where did he start it? In a garden. And we have the information there in Genesis that we read this morning. And God was the first gardener because he planted a garden in the east of Eden. The Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden. And there he put man whom he had formed. Adam's job was to keep that garden. And so the second Adam, which Romans chapter 5 calls Jesus, the second Adam who came to make things right because the first Adam sinned, he messed things up. But Jesus, the second Adam, came to put order and put things right. And Adam's job was to keep the garden beautiful. However, he came, Jesus came to restore paradise. The first Adam was lost because of his sin. Therefore, it was a beautiful garden that the resurrection should have taken place. But then we get to verses 16, the last verse that I will read this morning. And it says, Jesus said to Mary, she turned and said to him, Rabboni, which is to say teacher. So we've seen the mistake at the grave. We've seen the mistake with the gardener, Mary not recognizing who Jesus was. So we look at the third mistake and it's in the garden. And there we've read verses 16. Jesus said to her, Mary, she turned and said to him, Rabboni, which is to say teacher. It's interesting that Jesus made his first appearance after his resurrection in a garden to a woman. After all, Satan made his first appearance in a garden to a woman in Genesis 3. We know the story well. And as a woman was first to be deceived by Satan, she's the first to see the risen Christ. And yet a woman brought temptation to man, so she's first to bring the word of truth to man. And the environment was a garden. So do not mistake the missing the key point here. The work of what Jesus did. Even Jesus experienced his most intimate struggles in the Garden of Gethsemane. We know the story very well. In the Garden of Gethsemane, he sweated drops of blood. Judas betrayed him in the Garden of Gethsemane. But that was the start of his work to go to the cross. And this is what Easter is all about. is Jesus dying for us and going to the cross. The prophet Isaiah tells us that God loves us. He's got a plan for us. And it's interesting that when we talk about the soil, you know, Isaiah 61, 11 says, for the soil makes the young plant come up and a garden causes seed to grow. So the sovereign Lord will make righteousness and praise spring up before all nations. Adam and Eve were put out of the garden of Eden. That was the end of abundant living, the end of fruitful life. The loss of the garden meant for them hardship and hunger and toil and pain and sorrow when you read the story. And sometimes when we look at the garden, the garden speaks of life. The opposite of a garden is a wilderness. The gospel message of the resurrection is a source of abundant life. And if you want to have life this morning and life more abundantly, you need Jesus. However, sin brings barrenness to our lives. Sin causes emptiness. When you have Jesus, your life is complete. It's full. But if you don't have Jesus, there is barrenness in your life. And only God can fix that and restore it. The desert is the opposite of the garden because it symbolizes death and barrenness. But Jesus came to turn our personal deserts and our life into gardens to give us life abundantly. That's what he's offering this morning. A garden of beauty is a good environment for the production of or to produce the fruit of the Spirit, as Galatians 5 talks about. The workmanship, when anyone plants a garden for the sake of food or for beautiful flowers, it's done in hope. 
When the seed is planted, you plant it in hope. You cannot see it. It's like the kingdom of God. You cannot see it. In fact, Jesus looked at his own life as a seed. By planting it in death, he came forth. It's what 1 Corinthians 15 talks about. Paul the Apostle writes about it, that Christ is the first fruit after those who are, are Christ at his coming. After all, the Bible is full of garden terms when you see it. That Jesus is called the seed. He's called the branch. He's called the lily. He's called the rose. He's called the vine. After all, he is the Lord of the harvest and he's coming one day again to reap a harvest. So what Jesus is trying to do here is to get Mary to wake up. She sees this beautiful garden, all symbolically speaking about Jesus. But Jesus is trying to get her to wake up. And sometimes we're spiritually dead and we need to waken up to the reality. Tenderly, Jesus says to Mary, this is the voice of the gardener who wants Mary to wake up to reality. Mary speaks in Aramaic, which was the language of the time. If you ever seen the film, The Passion of the Christ, it's in Aramaic the common language of the people. But what lesson did Mary learn by mistaking Jesus for a gardener and the lessons in that garden? In fact, her sorrow started to change to joy when she realized who Jesus was. And it's when we realize who Jesus is, that sorrow turns to joy. As she recognized that Jesus was alive in the garden. After all, the garden tomb was a place of gloom. But... God made his greatest flower bloom in that garden. His son came to life three days in the grave and he came to life. What a wonderful truth as we conclude this morning. That was no ordinary Sunday 2,000 years ago because it would change history forever. And as we examine the Bible, we discover the garden, the gardens play a major role in history. After all, The removed stone means that Jesus got out of the grave and he was no ordinary gardener. He's the creator. Therefore, in the resurrection garden, there is so much to learn when you take a tour of the garden and you see what is in it. There is abundant life because Jesus only gives life and abundantly. So like all flowers, he had to burst forth from the darkness of the earth into life. So three mistakes in the resurrection story It was at the garden. Mary saw the stone removed. She didn't realize that Jesus got up from the grave. There was the strips, the grave clothes, the sobbing. Even seeing Jesus, she still never recognized him. And then there's the mistake with the gardener. It might look insignificant. And as we start to investigate, we start to see illustrations in that garden that speak of Jesus. And we get the information there in the garden that refers us back to a garden At the beginning of time, a garden called Eden, where mankind fell in sin, but Jesus came to make that right. He came to deal with the sin issue by dying on a cross, by shedding his own blood, that we can know what it is to have our sins forgiven. What a joy this morning. And in that garden, we see see the woman who was deceived in Eden, but yet she sees the truth of her risen Lord, bringing the first word of truth to the disciples. We see the work of Christ, but we look at our own lives and do are our lives empty, like a dry wilderness? We see God's workmanship, and sometimes we need to wake up to the spiritual truths. So that's the resurrection garden for you this morning. Next week, I will return to the book of Revelation as we're looking at the book of Revelation, but I hope you've gain something from the resurrection garden it's maybe not expository it's more topical this message today because you can only look at the christian story of of easter so many times but you always discover something new and that's what i've discovered as i've been reading the gospel of john and the resurrection story may god bless that